Hello, my name is Carl Jenner and welcome to my tutorial, an introduction to geographic information systems. This tutorial has three aims which are to answer the question, what is a geographic information system? To learn some of the basic terms used in a GIS and to look at some of the basic functions of a GIS. So we begin by answering the question, what are geographic information systems? Many people think of a GIS as a computer tool for making maps. Actually, it's a complex technology beginning with the digital representation of landscapes captured by cameras, digitizers or scanners, in some cases transmitted by a satellite, and with the help of computer systems stored, checked, manipulated, enhanced, analyzed and displayed as data reference to the Earth. Typical sources of geographic data for compu computer manipulation include digitized graphs, field survey data, aerial photographs, including infrared photographs and satellite imagery. Geographic information systems technology can be used for scientific investigations, resource management and development planning. For example, a GIS might allow emergency planners to easily calculate emergency response times in the event of a natural disaster, or a GIS might be used to find wetlands that need protection from pollution. Because a GIS deals with geographically referenced information, we should take some time to examine the properties of all real-world geographic information. The first property of all real-world geographic information is location. We can identify the location of objects by simply looking at a map and describing the locations of objects in relation to one another, or through some special coordinate system that provides locations of objects through its coordinates in space. For example, we can identify the location of different states on this map. Geographic information also includes attributes, which provide information about the location. For example, California, as a geographic object, has a number of attributes associated with it, including the population, the number of farms and the number of mobile homes. The final property of real-world geographic information is the spatial relationships associated with an object. Spatial relationships include such things as the shape, as the shape of an object or the relationship between the object and other objects. As we see here, California is a long and narrow state that is bordered by Oregon, Nevada and Arizona. So now that we understand the properties of real-world geographic information, we can, be we can begin to understand the process we go through when, when we identify geographic objects such as the states on this map. We will now look at spatial patterns. A spatial pattern is an arrangement of information in terms of physical space. Most spatial patterns you will see will show a top-down view of land with points, lines and areas representing people, places and environments on Earth's surface. Spatial patterns are normally illustrated using one of three patterns, which are point patterns, line patterns and area patterns, as mentioned. So first we will look at point patterns. A point pattern is a spatial pattern that is composed of closely arranged points. Each point re can represent anything, but in this case a point represents a city of 15,000 people or more. Notice that there are a cluster of smaller cities located around the larger cities such as San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, Dallas and Washington DC. This is a pattern, and perhaps the main reason is because larger cities draw, draw people to them because of the, the amenities that they offer in the form of entertainment, culture, professional opportunities and services. Land and housing prices are more expensive than larger cities, and only so many people can live there based on the available housing, so suburbs and smaller cities develop around the larger cities. Also, notice that the density of the cities increases from east to west. There are several reasons for this. The first is because historically the first immigrants came to the US from Europe and moved west. But fewer people moved west once they arrived in America, so most stayed near the coast where they arrived. The second reason is because the 100th meridian, which splits Texas down its western border, is the so-called line of aridity. As you move from east to west, the precipitation drops and the vegetation changes to a dry climate vegetation. Agriculture, population density and precipitation all change significantly in the Great Plains. We will now look at line patterns. An example of spatial line patterns might be found on a map of roads or river networks. Notice how many rivers flow into the Mississippi River, which is the river marked in red. Considering the vast area of the US that these rivers flow through, consider how much sediment which must be carried by each of these rivers, how much of this moves into the Mississippi River and then ends up in New Orleans. And finally, we will look at area patterns. 
Area patterns are used to show how statistics vary across a space of land. Here is a good example which shows the population density of US counties. So, looking at this diagram, we can see that the dark colors are all around the major cities, i.e. San Francisco, Chicago, Dallas, and Washington DC, etc., as you would predict. Also note, however, that there are trends like in, like in Colorado along the front range of the Rockies and on the eastern side of the Appalachian Mountains. Similarly, you will see a high population density around the coasts and other water sources. Note the drop in population density at the 100th meridian that we discussed with the point patterns. Finally, remember that patterns involve the spaces between the shades, such as the very low population density in the western and great plain states.